So first up, I've got a question for any scientists in the audience. Do you look like this? <laughs> well, I haven't actually seen any poisonous chemicals coming in, so I'm not sure. Um, this was actually drawn by one of my mother's school pupils in South Korea. But what's interesting is that if you ask a school pupil anywhere in the world to draw a scientist, they tend to look pretty similar. In 1983, there was the first study of the draw a scientist test, and they asked nearly 5,000 primary school children to draw a picture of a scientist. And what they found is that stereotypes emerge when children are really quite young, and most alarmingly, only 28 of those original students drew women. In contrast, glasses and facial hair made very regular appearances. So scientists might have a bit of an image problem, and there's other signs there's cause for concern. It's not all bad. Scientists have more public trust than politicians and bankers. But still, a recent public attitudes to science survey found that 35% of people think scientists manipulate their findings to come out with the answers they want. Uh, and we all know that any scientist speaking in favour of GM crops is paid by an evil multinational. So is this kind of image a surprise? I suspect probably not. I mean, most people don't actually personally know any scientists. And television has showed us that not all scientists have grey beards and conical flasks. But we're not exposed to the diversity of people who identify themselves as scientists. Scientists do appear in popular culture in literature, and in the last few years there have been some great mainstream books given realistic, if not always flattering, portrayals of scientists. Um, Solar is the, a satirical novel about a physicist working on solutions to climate change. And this came about when Ian McEwan visited the Arctic as part of an art and science, um, an art and climate change organisation. My favourite is Flight Behaviour, and this is the story of a dissatisfied housewife who goes to work with a team of ecologists studying monarch butterfly migration. And we're all completely beside ourselves, was inspired by experiments in the 1970s where chimpanzees were raised as humans. These are fantastic, but they're few and far between. What's far more common is to see a story about a writer, for example. People tend to write about what they know, and in general, what they know isn't science. So is this a problem? I think, given that we've seen the slight image problems scientists suffer from, then actually novels are an amazing way to just give an insight into a world that people wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. And this was one of my motivations when I started writing fiction. I was studying for a biology PhD at the time, and I saw lots of misconceptions, particularly in the mainstream media, about people like me. And I just wanted to give a more honest impression. S science is meant to be objective, free from emotion, but the same is really not true of scientists. So my novel is a, the story of the ethical choices faced by a group of scientists when activists destroy their field trial of GM crops. I, I wanted to explore their emotional journeys and just think about the biases that can creep in. Because it's not all about giving scientists a PR boost. The, many of the characters in the stories I've mentioned, they're not all likeable people, they're not all good people, and certainly my characters make some slightly dubious life choices. But it's about giving an honest impression of the diversity of people and emotions in science. Another way that, another thing that can be achieved by combining art and science is in the field of medical research, as we've just seen. Um, some mental health professionals, for example, have described how literature has helped them understand their patients and also motivated them to continue with their research. And this is very much true in my personal experience. When I was a teenager, I had epileptic seizures which weren't diagnosed. These aren't what you think of as seizures because I didn't lose consciousness. And I had a feeling that was just so weird that I didn't know how to describe it to people, and so I didn't try. And later, my seizures were diagnosed when I had more serious seizures, but still it was years before I felt comfortable explaining to anyone the experiences I'd had. And I finally did this through creative writing. This short story is on my website for anyone who's interested. And what was amazing about this is 
people, having people contact me and saying, yes, they have had these experiences. So what, si what science has achieved through the study of epilepsy is incredible. It's allowed people like me to lead entirely normal lives from medical advances. But through literature, I was able to achieve something that, that science couldn't, to have, give people a real idea of, of what it felt like to be me. But still, there's a divide. There's something that keeps artists from the world of science, scientists from the world of art. And I think sometimes our education system has perpetuated this myth, because it hasn't always been the case. In 1959, novelist and chemist C.P. Snow gave his famous lecture on the two cultures. And he argued that the divide between the humanities and the sciences was really a major hindrance to solving the world's challenges. Part of his evidence came from the fact that he went to literary gatherings where nobody could explain the second law of thermodynamics. I suspect that's true for a lot of us, but I do get concerned when people ask me not to explain something scientific to them because they won't understand. But historically, it was completely normal to be both a scientist and an artist. This is Darwin's contemporary, Alfred Russell Wallace, and he made great contributions to ev evolutionary theory, but he was also a social activist, an anthropologist, and a writer. And in the days before colour photography, you, as a biologist, you also had to be a great artist, and this is one of his pictures. T today, as you've heard, I work with Nobel laureates, and it's interesting how many science Nobel laureates describe an interest or a talent in music, in art, in literature, and I'm sure lots of you will feel in yourselves an affinity towards both areas. You can see that people have been combining these in really creative ways. This is the SciArt hashtag on Twitter, which has got some really beautiful pictures you can see. And I think in literature, there's a bit more work to do, and we're all well-placed to deal with this. For a start, scientists talk to writers. Science is an amazing source of ideas, and don't keep these to yourselves. Science is changing society, and so it's not just science fiction that can be used, but real-life science experiences can be an amazing source of stories. And when I say talk to writers, I mean anyone who's interested in writing fiction. <laughs> in particular, if you're a scientist, if you're an engineer, if you're a teacher, lose your inhibitions about writing fiction. That voice in your head that says, why am I bothering, I'm rubbish, this is ridiculous, don't listen to it. We all get it, it probably holds you back in other ways, just ignore it. There are lots of books, lots of websites that can help give you guiders as you um, start on a journey looking at literature. And also it's great to meet up with people of lots of different backgrounds and share your ideas, share your stories. Websites are interested in publishing you, and I particularly wanted to mention lablet.com, which is dedicated to the culture of science in fiction. And if you are interested in this area, I can definitely recommend checking this out. But don't let the thought of publication hold you back. That's not what it's all about. When I'm not writing, I like to sail dinghies. No one expects me to publish that. And if I come last in races, and I do, people don't think, oh, I should be using my energies elsewhere. And it's exactly the same for creative writing. It's a really valuable hobby, even if no one ever reads what you create. Likewise, science is a fantastic hobby for artists. And it, science is so accessible now through books, through YouTube, through free online courses. And what's really amazing is you can also contribute to new scientific knowledge as part of citizen science projects. You can count birds, or galaxies, or butterflies. And actually, I think it is really important for society that scientists don't have a monopoly on scientific knowledge. Scientific discoveries are changing the world. They're affecting us all, so we all have a say as we make decisions about everything from climate change mitigation to stem cell research. And if we're all involved in these decisions, then we all need to understand the knowledge and the evidence surrounding them. And you don't need to a PhD to access scientific knowledge. 
We all need to feel empowered to do this, even if our teachers told us we were arts people. So I think it's time to just reconsider these neat categories that we've put both people and subjects into, because along the way, lots of people start to believe that they can only do art or sciences, uh, and what's even worse is that actually lots of people feel excluded from both. So I want to encourage everyone to explore all their talents and also to just feel empowered to do things, even if they're not any good at them. I don't think anyone should feel either that science is only for other people or that creative writing is only for other people. We are all should feel empowered to take part in these things. So I very much look forward to reading anything creative you produce together. Thank you very much.